hello everyone. Thanks for joining this week. Um, this week we'll be talking about machine translation. Um, over the discussion today, we're going to, there are three presenters. So I'll be first discussing, uh, sort of introducing the, the topic uh, and some basic ideas. I'm going to talk about some of the classical approaches and the statistical approaches. Uh, Taha will take over from there and discuss uh, some of, uh, uh, Taha and Shenting will be discussing the, some of the more recent approaches afterwards. So uh, to get started, um, to begin, it's, uh, to begin with, um, machine translation, quite simply put, is the idea of taking a sentence from one language uh, or what we call the source language and then translating it into another sentence Y in a target language. So you can see the examples, um, uh, you can see an example, uh, you have a quote in, uh, in French and then the corresponding sentence in English. And the key idea here is that when you have sentences like these that are translated, we follow some basic, uh, we, we follow some, uh, we keep some guidelines in mind. So ideally we want the sentences to be, uh, to have the same sort of meaning. Um, we would also like them to have the same tone uh, and, the, uh, and the same overall uh, form of expression that was there in the original sentence if possible. So for example, if you can see sentences here um, that say, I need to study today, we would like the same uh, sense of necessity and the meaning to be uh, expressed in the sentence as well. We would like it to be in the same person. Uh, title screen, actually, just a machine translation title slide. Have you advanced the slide? Yeah. Oh, it's still in the title. Okay. A anyone else can see the other slides? Okay, maybe maybe I'll just uh, try to share again. I might have made a mistake there. Okay, uh, so quickly to back up, um, I hope you can see the slides changing now. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. So, so quickly to back up, uh, I was just saying um, that the idea of machine translation is to uh, take a sentence X in a source language and to translate it into another sentence in a target language. Uh, for example, you can see here there is a quote in French and then the corresponding sentence in English. Um, I'm not going to try to say it because I don't speak French, but the idea is that you want to have the same uh, the same meaning, the same tone and expression to carry over to the other language as well. So the task really is that given one sentence and um, you want to produce the other. And when, in doing so, ideally you want to preserve the, some, you want to preserve the grammatical correctness. So when you do write a sentence in the target language, you want it to be correct in that language. And you would also like that sentence to be, uh, to preserve some of the meaning and sentiment like I mentioned earlier. So, um, one of the one of the when you when you look at this examine this these pairs of sentences at first one of the first things that comes to mind is that we can perhaps think of some correspondences between the words in these uh, sentences and the idea is that we want to try and think about how these words correspond and interact in both these sentences and this is how the classical uh, approach to machine translation was motivated so for example, you can see um, in the first sentence, it just so happens that all the words have an exact one-to-one -one correspondence with the with tokens in German, and the order is the same as well. But in the second one, you see that some of the words have been shuffled around, and some words uh, don't have any correspondence at all. So today, the word for today, heute, appears much further ahead in the sentence, and the word to in English has uh, no corresponding token in German. So these are some of the uh, the, cha the challenges when you start thinking about translation in a classical sense. So um, it also brings to mind that when you translate these sentences, um, we might we will need an evaluation metric, metric we will dis which we will discuss uh, in a in a bit, and this metric will also have to accommodate you know multiple possible translations, and we'll have to sort of just measure how close a prediction. Uh, is to the actual translation rather than just telling us that it's correct or wrong, which is quite important for later neural approaches. So um, this is a brief, uh, this is actually a video, quick video that was, uh, that, was, uh, that Shen Ting shared uh, about the history of machine translation. It's actually uh, quite short, um, but in the interest of time, I will skip over it. It's a video that talks about how a state-of-the-art machine um, 
is suddenly capable of uh, trans is, it could one day be capable of translating Russian to English and allowing the Americans to you know, maintain surveillance over all the literature that's going around in the Soviet Union. So yeah, it was how it was considered a very difficult task. So um, moving on to the classical approach, uh, in the classical approach to machine, machine translation, you don't allow for any idea. Uh, you, you basically try to analyze the sentences and try to understand from the linguistic point of view. So for example, given a sentence in a source language and uh, given the task you want to convert black, um, uh, sentences from say English to Japanese, uh, one of the first things you would do is to study the source language and to see how are the subject, verb, and object placed in these sentences. Okay, and then we want to also analyze the sentence and write down, okay, this is the polarity of sentence, largely a positive sentence that says we are going to win or so, so, so on. You identify the subject, the tense, and so on. Um, so you would also then ob observe, observe like any of the language specific rules on how you place the uh, words along the sentence. So one example is that uh, in the previous example that I showed you in German, you, um, one of the rules is that either the verb goes in the second place here or it goes in the last place, like, in here, like here. So these are the kind of things that you want to analyze and identify. identify. So um, now, now that, that, uh, now that once you've done that in a classic approach, the idea would be then that you want to have a dic dictionary-based uh, substitution rules set up. So you want to have one-to-one -one mapping from tokens and to tokens in the other language. So this can get a bit tricky because you can have uh, tokens that have multiple meanings or multiple synonyms and so on. And additionally, that some, some synonyms might be more suitable than others. So uh, here, it, the, the idea is also that you, you might have to uh, consider uh, disambiguation when there are multiple possible substitutions and you also want to assign probability scores to them, which we will get to in a minute. But um, once, once you've completed uh, these two steps in a classic approach, you would, basically, um, you would basically apply these rules and translate the sentence and then adjust, uh, adjust for language specific rules. So like I said, uh, the rule I highlighted here. So in the target sentence, you would then rearrange the words and so on make some uh, fixes to make it a coherent translation. So this is how a classic approach to machine translation was first envisioned when they were proposed. And this is considered to be a very hard task because as you can see here, um, you need knowledge about the, 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 both the languages at play. Um, you need, uh, this is quite cumbersome to do this sort of analysis for pairs of languages. There can be quite a lot of exceptions in, to the rule. There's a lot of engineering work to do. And additionally, even after doing so, you might find that this only works within specific uh, domains. So for example, you might be able to follow these rules and uh, translate weather reports from one language to another, but it might be quite hard to apply it in a broad sense for all documents of the language coming from around. So these are the shortcomings of the classic approach. So we, we don't want to further go into the approaches there. We can then move on to discuss how the statistical approaches were motivated. So this part is actually quite interesting because the idea here is that you want to try and assign probabilities to translations, which starts becoming a key idea in all the future approaches. You will see that the idea is basically to try and pick translations which have the highest prob probability of being right. And the differences between the various models and statistical approaches is to discuss uh, how, how you actually define this probability. So um, in this, to begin with, um, let's define a, a target. Okay, so so actually, um, it would be when we look at this problem. This was actually originally written around translation of French to English. So you see the target language being called E and the source language being called F, and then basically you define um, you define the problem as follows: given a sentence in French, so the F basically represents the target French sentence you want to basically obtain a sentence E in English such that you maximize the probability of probability of E given F in some sort of definition of this probability. So, um, so, so basically the idea here becomes that um, you can apply base rule as you can see on the right side. And then uh, it basically comes down to the idea of maximizing uh, the, the, the denominator in the base rule actually is the prior uh, within the language, so we don't consider that. But since we are trying to obtain the ma maximize the probability by varying the sentence in English that we're trying to predict, 
So we look at the numerator alone, and that gives us two parts. So there's P of E and then P of F given E. So what does this mean? So when you do predict a sentence in English E for the given sentence in F, you're going to look at two probabilities. The first one is P of F given E. So this is what is called faithfulness. So what it means is that we, we sort of imagine this as this component as be representing how close the meaning of the sentence in English is to the corresponding sentence in French. So here we are looking, we are setting aside things like the fluency of the language, how correct it is. And we're just looking at how closely it sticks to the original source language, um, the source language sentence. So that is P of F given E. Then P of E then models how likely the sentence by itself is likely to occur in English. So for example, if I said, uh, the word is flying, the sentence is extremely likely to occur in English because the, gra the grammar is correct. Tokens quite often occur together in a natural corpus. So these are all the things that are covered by the fluency component. So this is basically, uh, this is basically how we uh, consider the static, this is basically how we model all the statistic approaches. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's actually correct. That it should be a proportionality. Yeah. So, so then um, one of the first things we need if we want to do a translation of this nature is that you want to have a corpus which is parallel in both the source and the target language. So what does this mean? You, it means that we require a corpus where you can map a sentence in the source and a sentence in the target as having the same meaning and being the correct translations. So these are often obtained from things like transcripts of parli uh, European parliament proceedings, the UN proceedings and so on, where in real time these, these statements are translated into a number of languages. So that's a good source of corpus. So the next thing is that given a sentence, um, if you look at the, uh, uh, if a while ago we discussed these alignments, the alignments you can see here. So given the corpus and given these sentences, suppose these were found side by side in the corpus itself, we still want to know what the alignments are. So we'll have to, we'll have to, consider some issues that the tokens may be out of order, some tokens might not have a mapping. And we now have to come up with a way to compute the probabilities for the translation between word to word. So to clarify, what are we doing here? One of the model, earlier models, the earliest models that was proposed, the first IBM model, basically tries to take a source sentence and a target sentence. And basically, um, assuming that these are the correct translations, it tries to understand um, understand uh, some sort of alignment. So what, the, what does this mean? So basically it is alignment can be as simple as a token in the source language corresponding to a token in the target language. And the IBM model basically introduces word alignments as a parameter and tries to learn them from the corpus that, you are give, that they are given. So the key here is that um, the first models only considered many to one relations, which means that uh, many terms in the source could correspond to one in the target, but not the other way around. So this was just one of the modeling constraints they imposed. And the idea was basically in line with the, the probability metrics that we calculated here. Uh, they, tried to ca they tried to assign, they tried to include alignments and calculate the same metric again. So what are the different components here? So they make some assign, um, LE is supposed to be the length of the English sentence and LS the length of the French sentence. So the idea is they assume that all sentence lengths have equal probability. And then they, um, they basically consider this to be the probability of the alignment that is being considered. Now, what happens, in, what happens here basically determines the probability, how the probabilities are assigned. So you're basically kind of trying to build a translation table of FI or the term I in the, in, in the French sentence uh, to a, Oh, sorry, FJ in the French sentence to the corresponding English sentence token. So uh, for example, in this case, we are trying to calculate, our we are trying to get a translation table that gives us a probability for the correspondence of the first token here and these two tokens here or, or in some other sense. And then you, you uh, assume independence and multiply them across to get a probability uh, across. So this will give you a probability score for the translation itself. And so, so this, is, this is basically the model that they introduced, but you still have to learn, learn these components somehow. So how do you pick the alignments that are used? So they use an EM algorithm. So um, the idea is basically that you, you base it entirely on the counts uh, of how, 
uh, how the French and English tokens occur in correspondence. So I'm going to step over this for a minute because uh, there are quite a lot of neural approaches to dis discuss. But the key idea here is that the IBM model makes a bunch of simplifying assumptions. This was one of the earliest statistical models. It assumes that all alignments and all sentence lengths are equally probable and then uses an EM algorithm to try and uh, try and get the uh, to max it, uh, to get the term t here, which is basically a table of translation between the tokens by maximizing the probability uh, and varying the alignments in each iteration. So, as EM algorithms work, in every iteration they try to uh, increase the likelihood of the the, the 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 given data, and that's basically what's being done by varying the alignments and then calculating the term frequencies again and again. So once you have these term frequencies, you would basically just go ahead and make the prediction, uh, make, make your predictions uh, by directly plugging in the values from the source sentence and seeing what comes up. But before we go to the decoding process, one of the key ideas that comes up is that terms, we don't need to actually consider translation at the word level alone. We can maybe think about translation at a phrase level. So again, consider here the new example uh, shown in the diagram. You can see the an English sentence split by tokens along this side, and uh, a German sentence split by token along this side. And in the earlier um, translation methods that only considered words as the basic unit, you would basically only have correspondence that are one one and passing through. So you you one one. So so the idea basically here is that um, you miss out on correspondences that go, for example, here that the word assumes actually is explained, uh, is translated into three tokens in the target language is actually missed out. So these are the kind of uh, tr translations that, um, that are missed. So how can we, how can we fix, how can we start, fix this issue? So the easiest way to do this is to go back to the previous approach, try to get the alignment for English to German, which is the table on the left here. And then you have the alignments for German to English, which is the other way around on the table on the right. And you merge them to get a, a ma uh, merge them to get matches which actually correspond to many tokens in the source and many tokens in the target, which basically means you're mapping phrases in the source to phrases in the targets. So this is just a, a very quick overview of this idea. But the idea here goes, for example, that if you see assumes basically matches to three tokens here, and that matches to this token. So this entire block here can be considered a phrase correspondence, which means that the phrase assumes that corresponds to the tokens all along here. And these are the kind of phrase to phrase correspondences that can actually help us uh, come up with a better idea of translation because phrases have more meaning together than words have individually. So either through this, either through the previous method through the EM algorithm or a phrase based approach, Basically what we have is that we have a set of alignments and using these alignments, we have to decode and make the prediction on the target sentence. So this is, this is common to both approaches. Um, so what we do here is that we basically calculate a score based on the counts. Um, so in the original approach, we calculated a score uh, every step in the EM algorithm. So the probability we would be interested, for example, in this case is P of uh, A comma F given E. So this, this is the probability, which means that given this alignment and the French uh, token, what is the probability, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, what is the probability of the current alignment and the French sentence given the English sentence? So these are the kinds of uh, probabilities that we already calculated from before. So we have the ability to use Bayes rule and calculate P of F given E or E given F. And similarly, using these, comp these phrase components, we can do the same thing. So once we have these scores, how do we actually make the, the predictions? So um, that it's, it's actually uh, quite interesting uh, that when you do the decoding, you want to produce a sentence where the translation of the phrases corresponds uh, well with, the trans, uh, with phrases in the source sentence. You want to make sure that the, sentence, uh, the sentences are largely structured the same way. And then you want to make sure that it's a coherent sentence. So these are the three ideas that are basically used when you decode. So what you do is that you assign 
a, a, a language model score. So this can be based on a n-gram approach. So if you have a if a sentence has a high probability based on an n n-gram uh, n based on n-gram probabilities, it means that the sentence is actually um, coherent or is likely to happen in natural language. Then you have a reordering penalty. So what you do is that if phrases are very close together in the source uh, in the source sentence, but very far away in the predicted sentence, you are, you apply a penalty. So you apply a penalty and say that um, these these sentence these are uh, these two phrases are talking probably about something common or about each other, and they should be close together and they shouldn't be so far away. So you apply a penalty for that, and then um, you just use the the existing translation dictionary that we calculated. And um, you, if you multiply all three of these, basically what you get is that you get a hybrid probability score for each prediction. And then you try to basically do a, a argmax on all of these. So, so the idea is that you have a, a bunch of choices. So for example, if you consider one phrase, then uh, 10 Borschlag, you are seeing all the different possible correspondences to phrases that were found, and their corresponding probabilities uh, or corresponding likelihood scores. So you can use this as the the score for the phrase translation, and then across the sentence you apply the reordering penalty and the language model score, and then you get a score. So for all of these candidates, for every one of these candidates and every one of the reorderings, you basically go through all of these and select the one that scores best. So the, so essentially what you're doing is that there are a large number of options based on the different phrases and the different orderings, and you're selecting the best of them. So you obviously need a efficient way to do this. And some of the approaches that we, to do this would be greedy. Um, I, I, uh, this this has a, actually has a lot of, um, lot of an, uh, analogs and other, other tasks. So you can use existing greedy algorithms to do it or Viterbi and other, other such algorithms might, might be relevant here. So, that's basically the key idea. So that when when you, to recap, you basically use either a word-based approach or a phase-based approach to establish a translation dictionary. And then you apply some reordering penalties and a language model score to try and select the best outcome. And you do that using your greedy approach. So let's say you've actually decoded a sentence and you have you, you, you got some output out of your model and you have a correct translation. So how do you evaluate it? And this is where, this is an idea that can be, that will be useful to later as well, um, to the neural approaches. So the key idea is that you can't just dismiss a translation as being wrong because of small errors, because that doesn't really appreciate how well the model has done and it doesn't help you train anything using the gradient either. So the idea is you want uh, a sort of a, a metric that can tell how correct or wrong it is. And so one of some early approaches used the word error rate. That means that you just look at how many words were right in the prediction and how many were not there in the reference. So you throw them away. But the problem here really becomes that uh, there are synonyms for words. And also that, uh, also that if words are rearranged, their meanings can be drastically different. So word error rate is not really a great way to look at it. So another popular evaluation metric that was uh, uh, brought uh, that came up and it's quite used even till today uh, is the blue score or the um, yeah so the blue score is basically about uh, making sure that you 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 consider the the ratio of correct in grams so so that uh, one of the ways to circumvent the problem with ordering of tokens would be to consider how many n grams were right or wrong and you can just take the number of correct output n-grams by the total number of out n-grams that were predicted. And that would be a precision score. But the problem here is that the model has the choice of predicting very few n-grams, making the denominator very small and artificially inflating the score. So you want to adjust, uh, you want to adjust the model for that. Uh, so you apply what is called a brevity penalty. So basically you just penalize the model for predicting a sentence that is too short as well. And additionally, another problem that can happen is that the, uh, to circumvent the brevity penalty, the model can just keep predicting one engram that it knows to be right a lot of times. So it will make the, it, it avoids the brevity penalty and also gets a good number of uh, correct engrams artificially inflating the count. So how, like for example, if the correct sentence is the cat sat on the mat and the model keeps predicting the cat, the cat, the cat, 
you see that all of the engrams it predicted are technically correct, but it missed out a lot as well. So what you do is you clip the counts. Uh, what that means is that if the engram the cat appeared only once in the reference, it only I only count it once to be correct in my uh, in the predicted sentence as well. So this is called clipping the engram counts. So combining both of them together, uh, you get what is called the blue score. And the blue score is usually not just calculated for a one particular value of n. So when you collect, for example, the blue four score, it takes all n-grams, n-grams of size one, two, three, and four. So, and it combines them in a, uh, in a geometric mean. So you can see here. So the first term is the gravity penalty. So if the output length in this version of uh, the blue score, if the output length is actually uh, shorter than the reference length, you apply a penalty, but if it's greater, you just don't uh, apply anything at all. So that, that's basically the idea behind the first term. The second term is the precision, which is what we calculated here uh, using the clipped counts. And you take the uh, n grams of size one, two, three, and four, and then you form the evaluation metric. So now that you actually have a real number score for the predictions you're making with respect to an evaluation, uh, you can move on to part two, which is basically the neural approaches, uh, where you need this sort of a score to use the grade, uh, to use as a gradient, uh, and then train your model. So I'm going to hand it off here. Yeah. If there are any questions about the classic approaches, uh, yeah, you can ask me. Okay. Uh, any of you have any questions about uh, statistical and, and probabilistic SMT? So Shashank covered, uh, I think, the basic model, model one. So there's a uh, model one through four. Um, they're all very classical approaches that were developed in the 80s to machine translation. Um, they're, they're very, uh, I think, theoretically appealing. They're very simple models. And they have a lot of mileage. They actually do very well at that time. And, and they were really state of the art for quite a number of years. Um, so it's worthwhile if you're, um, thinking about neural models to study these, because uh, I think, uh, you know, machine translation is one of the highlight applications of NLP. And um, definitely studying these classic models gives you insight about um, how people thought about the first versions of statistical methods to NLP when corpora was actually uh, somewhat available. So, um, any of you would like to highlight any of the other models, like model two, model three, model four, that you remember from your studies? Who has studied the SMT models? Has anyone studied the SMT models? I, I, I remember that the, the other, the IBM two through four models basically just uh, try to overcome some of the simplifying assumptions that we made in model one. So uh, for example, um, some of the assi 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 assumptions that were made in model one were that, uh, for example, that all sentence, le sentence lengths actually have an equal probability of occurring, or that the align all alignments have equal probability of occurring. And incrementally, I, what I remember is that these models basically uh, eliminate these assumptions and uh, make it m improve the performance. Yeah, so you can think of these as all incremental works built over IBM Model 1. And they have uh, various things. So one thing that's um, interesting that you may want to think about is this idea of fertility. Okay, that's saying that a single word could, uh, in one source language, could lead to uh, several different words in a target language. Okay, so... Um, and then, uh, for example, in English, you might have the word no, right? But in French, you have ne pas, right? Which is two tokens. So um, the fertility of this word gets uh, duplicated twice. When you do the translation, it goes down to something like no and no. And then the alignment is given such that no corresponds to ne, and the second no corresponds to pas. So uh, you can think about this as a generative model too. You know, it's basically generating tokens and then uh, using a transformational model to map them or alignment model. And uh, that, that's a, a very helpful paradigm to think about uh, for, for um, you know, any type of model that might have an inverse. So in NLP, typically you're processing, not generating. So 
you're, you're discriminating. But then uh, on the flip side of things, uh, you know, NLG, like what Ming Yangming does and other people in the group do, to like uh, to generate uh, dialogue or utterances, you have to flip the, the uh, understanding model on its side, right, on its head and say, okay, is, is it practical to have it as a real inverse? Usually no. Um, there are just some uh, specific tricks you have to do to make it uh, more uh, worthwhile to consider uh, uh, specialities in the model. But I think the IBM models, one through four, they have that really nice elegance. It's a very classy model. So uh, you should all know that. You know, It's one of those things, if you go to a conference and you, somebody says IBM model free and you don't know what it is, you, you feel like a little bit of an outsider. Okay, so it's, it's good to know those, those models. Okay. Okay, so for part two, we are going to talk about uh, some of the main ideas of neural machine translation. And uh, by popular request, I've included a small section on word sense disambiguation. And I've also added a very short uh, few slides on implementing uh, NMT in Python. Okay, so the first idea that we have for neural machine translation is this idea called sequence to sequence. So the sequence to sequence model is based the main basic uh, neural machine translation kind of model. What it does is that you use two RNNs and one RNN corresponds to your input language, one RNN corresponds to your output language, and you basically uh, train both RNNs on the input and the source, uh, on the source and the output uh, text. And this then does your machine translation for you. So it's not a new idea because many other NLP tasks also use uh, sequence sequence. We heard about uh, text summarization a few weeks ago. Uh, dialogues also use it to go from previous utterance to the next utterance, uh, parsing and code generation, which Technically, you can say it's also a form of machine translation. Okay, so uh, there's a huge, there's a really, really good animated illustrative guide on this. And also from one of the papers that we linked, uh, there's just this uh, diagram that shows you a rough idea of what we mean by we have two recurrent neural networks. So when you mean two recurrent neural networks here, let's make it more specific. So we have the top uh, network and the bottom network here? Yes. Okay. And what are their functions? Can you um, illustrate to, to us? So it's actually what the first one does is that it uh, takes in the source language. It you can think of it as it is encoding the, the, the source language. And then it is then, uh, based on this en encoding, the other RNN then decodes it to give you the target language. So this, this idea of, a, of an encoder and a decoder is going to be very central in a lot of the other models that we are going to be seeing. So the idea is that you take a representation of the encoder learns a representation of your input language. The decoder learns how do you generate the output language from your, your encoding. Okay, any further questions? Yeah, why don't we go over all, what all these arrows mean so it's easier to figure out. Uh, I mean, anyone else who knows it uh, can can also specify. Okay, so for example, um, the bottom arrows here that are over the input, right? So these are the tokens that are going in to the encoder. The encoder is then encoding them and outputting them at these positions, right? So these are the encodings of the word, uh, the first token. Um, in, in this particular part here, right? But then um, 
this information uh, for the encoding of D, right, it's taking an, an in as input, uh, two inputs, right, the encoding, the, the token B itself, as well as the information from the previous state of the encoder, um, and then encoding B as a contextual representation of the fact that it came after A, right? And then uh, we're building this representation and passing it along to the um, decoder, right? So the decoder is keeping all of this information and finally building a representation of the sentence here, right? Um, meaning um, you, know, you have the utterance A, B, C, and D, and, and you have these two outputs uh, at the top, right? And then it's being fed into the encoder and decoder on the other side. Okay. Let, let's ask everyone just to make sure because this is sort of fundamental information. Uh, what's the difference between the information that's passed by the uh, encoder uh, between D and the uh, end of sentence and then between the decoder um, at that position? What do you guys think? Do you mean the information transferred in the first and second layers? Or? Yes. So mm -hmm. we've specified here we have two, two different uh, RNAs. One that's the encoder, right, R E N, and our decoder, D E. Oh. Right. So after they've encoded and decoded uh, the input, Right, so our input is here on the bottom A, B, C, D. There are then two arrows from the two last blue boxes, right, um, that are going to the red boxes for the um, the output, right, when the RNN is in its generative mode. Right, what what are the these two yellow states, uh, yellow transitions, uh, transmitting? Any idea? So uh, I think from the Elmo paper, uh, since the second one is a more deepened representation of the uh, sentence A B C D, uh, I think they were explaining that in the first layers, uh, it is more of a syntactic information that is being passed, and in the in the upper layers, it's more semantic. So I'm not sure, but is it that or? So that, that would be fine if we're talking about multiple encodings, right? When you have a, a multiple layers stacked on top of each other and each of these are encoding more features, right? This is similar to what you would have in a neural network architecture for vision, right? We have like low level features at the bottom and then high level features towards the top. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. So here we have just one layer, two different RNNs, right? The first yeah. one is the one of yeah. ice. And then one for the decoder. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, you would see, you wouldn't see this part, right? You would see just the encoder. Being yeah, okay. At the bottom. And yeah, then it's just the sentence embed, right? The decoder on the second part, right? Yes. So yeah, and just the representation for the sentence. I think. Yeah, uh, make sure we we understand this diagram properly. I'm gonna go look at it as well too and see where it is. Any other comments first about this particular diagram? Because if I, if I recall correctly, I don't think this is the right um, the right thing to say. I think it's more like what Taha is saying is that we have the encoder and the decoder being separate halves. So we have an encoder on one side and a decoder on the other side. Okay, 
and that we have uh, maybe a two-layer RNN, right? So we have an RNN one to capture the syntactic stuff, and and maybe the RNN two to capture more higher-grain features, and then um, they they just happen to run across. But I'm going to look at the paper because uh, I think you guys said it was from uh, the Long and All paper, right? Yeah. So uh, they do say this is a stacked recurrent architecture. So this is uh, more this way. Uh, so the encoder is on one side, the decoder is on the other side. Okay. Yes. Yes, I think also the same. Uh, hello, I'm Saron in here. Yeah. Hi, Saron. Hi. I, I also uh, think the same. Uh, it is a stacked door and then in the decoding part uh, of, let's say the first word X in the decoding part contains the contextual representation uh, of the RNN2. Uh, if you compare RNN2 and the RNN1, uh, maybe if we want to, uh, if, you, if we extract the representation from the RNN2, we can get more contextual information from the, from the RNN2. Right. So because RNN2 runs over the output of RNN1, it gets to see a larger context, right? It's, yes. It has yes. to forget or remember other information that RNN1 may not locally pay attention to, right? So this is the motivation for uh, their paper about um, attention mechanisms rather than doing a stacked uh, RNN. So this is the motivation for attention. Right, because this, this model doesn't work well. Okay. Yeah, so I think, uh, Shenting, you're going to go over the attention diagram later, right? So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are we all clear about that? I think we, we do need to be clear because I also got a, you know, uh, a misunderstanding there that the top model and the bottom model are, are uh, the encoder decoder, but it's not, right? So it's the colors that indicate that. Okay, uh, so with that, I think as a background, so the main paper that we probably are looking at today is this paper called Attention is All You Need. Uh, the main idea is that they want to create a neural machine translation network entirely using what they call the attention mechanism for machine translation. So meaning that like what we said earlier, we totally remove any of the recurrence units like the, the RNA. And we just use uh, attention units to build a machine translation model. So the motivation or rather what's out of the goals is that they want to reduce uh, sequential computations. We will explain this in a while. And also they want to better learn the long range dependencies across uh, the entire text. So any questions? If not, we'll move on. Okay, so uh, first there's the idea of what is the difference between self-attention and convolution. So the idea of convolution is that for each of the relative position, you have uh, different linear transforms, but your self-attention is just a simple weighted average. Okay, so next, uh, we talk about attention in general and what it actually means, right, from the paper. So, they explain it as attention as mapping a query and a set of uh, key value pairs to an output. And these are all represented as a vectors, as vectors. And in general, the output is just a weighted sum of the values. 
So this goes back to the idea of what we have for self-attention. It's just a weighted average. And the weights, uh, they just call it, define it as a compatibility function of the query with a corresponding key. What do they mean here by compatibility function? I mean, other people on the call can help out too. I mean, it's supposed to be a yeah. reason after all. So if, let me find the data. I guess it's like a similarity. A similarity score? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's a dot product, right? So it's kind of like cosine similarity. It could be, right? I think what they're saying is it's a function, right? it's a function. It could be a dot product. It doesn't have to be. It just needs to take in a key and a query and then calculate something as a result, right? And then map it out as a value. Right, so it, it could be as simple as a dot product, but it, it wouldn't need to be, right? Oh yeah, I guess, I guess this would be like a general, like the general idea as opposed to the implementation. Right. Yeah, I think it's basically a weighted dot product, right? So that it can learn more complex uh, relations between query and key. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so why why would attention be useful uh, for for the types of models? I mean, we we understand that if two two vectors have a cosine that's high, they're sort of similar to each other. So um, probably it would place a lot of attention on that, right? Um, but the weights could change that. Everyone with me so far? Yeah. Okay, so let me give you a, a question. Let's say I have cat, okay, uh, as query, because it's a word that I want to do something with, right? And then in the sentence, I have some words, okay? Let's say I have the word cat, I have the word dog, and I have chase, okay? Um, how does what I'm doing uh, with the dot product uh, allow me to um, do useful things here? I mean, for example, you would expect cat to be highly activated itself, right? Yeah. But the cosine value is high. But does this usefully mean anything uh, in, in terms of downstream or, and, and is the training able to, uh, let that go away so that you can concentrate on um, you know, other functions that are more necessary. But usually when you're training, let's say, this bird, you mask out the token itself. Or if you're training a, a causal model, then you only allow it to attend to everything before it. So at training time, you don't actually see, the model doesn't actually see the token itself. Okay, yeah. I mean, let's say cat is somewhere else in the input. Would it be able to see that? Yeah, then, then, then yeah, it would be able to see that. Right, so then it would have a self-similar cosine score. Like say cat was the query, but I have another sentence that I want to attend to. The cat was on the map. Okay, eating, eating milk or something like that. I, I think it, it is really quite um, essential, I think, if we're doing NLP to uh, really try to dive deep into why the models work, uh, what is the similarity between the we're waiting uh, doing so that we understand uh, how this magic can be done. Because it's not magic, it's just math, right? So we, we need to know why the training process is able to like take a cosine similarity that might be very close to one, for example, cat or and itself or cat and tiger, and apply that to a very low coefficient through the weighting procedure, right? Or taking something that might not be so similar and, and uh, activating that uh, with a higher. Right. 
right? Like say, if I wanted to attend to what the cat is doing, right? So um, it's drinking milk. So I want uh, after reading cat for the attention to um, wait on drinking, right? Then how, how does this process achieve that? What in the training procedure? <laughs> Mm, but actually, if the token was also somewhere else in the sentence, the the model doesn't really know that that's the same token, right? Because because you can't see the token itself, so it does, it's kind of like asking the model to predict what the token is without telling you what it is. Right. So we're providing all the input up to that point, but we're not providing the token itself. Yeah. So so then since it's I guess it's it's learning some type of information based on the position in the sequence as well. So it I don't I don't really see how it could learn to say look at a to at the same token that's somewhere else in the input. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, I guess we should move on. But I, again, it's, it's important to try to um, get a good understanding about what, what is happening. I mean, we understand the dot product between vectors, right? And we understand that the weight is pretty much the only thing that's uh, um, normalizing or changing the dot product for the attention to take effect, right? So you have to think about when, when the dot product between two vectors is high, uh, how how do I um, use the weights to affect that, right? So that I can uh, cast attention where I want it to go. Okay, sorry, let's go on. Okay, so uh, the paper introduces this uh, the attention unit, which is called a scale dot product attention unit. So. The main idea is that you compute the dot products of the query and the key, and then you scale it by the square root of the dimension size, and then you apply a softmax to it. So on the diagram on the right, uh, they also have one step in pink, which is uh, labeled as masking, but that is an optional step. So the main idea is that you you take a dot product, you scale, and then you take a softmax. And then after that, you again take a dot product with the values. And importantly, the number of total number of operations that needs to be done in this uh, scale dot product attention is uh, the dimension of the queries and the keys uh, times n, which is the uh, size of your tokens here. Okay, so when we covered the transformer in BERT uh, at the first lecture, we also talked about this. So hopefully this is um, old hat to most of you, right? So we said that uh, basically looking at the transformer model was a, a, a big speed up, right? Because the standard RNN approaches uh, have to sequentially process everything, right? And the attention can be done uh, simultaneously across all the input tokens all in one go. So um, that, that's why we have this uh, big savings in the number of operations, right? And we also discussed a little bit uh, the, the difference between a query and a key and a value, especially between the, uh, sorry, between the key and the value, right? Uh, what are the differences between these two different things, right? I mean, it's, I think, quite easy to understand query and key. Uh, and the value is what's being written out, right? What, what is uh, being casted out as the separate branch 
uh, in the final uh, product. Does anyone want to say anything about the value? Okay, I think this is related a lot to what I was discussing earlier. You know, when I, I was saying, you know, you want the cat, if you want to read the input token cat to, to attend to something else, basically your value allows you to transform it to whatever you want, right? You can store anything, I mean, as, as a lookup to a key, you can store anything you want, right? You have a cat, you can look up uh, drink or, or you know, any other type of uh, vector representation of some, some other thing, right? So you don't necessarily have to store the key back, but you can. So you, sometimes you'll see the key and the value are the same thing. Okay, I'm happy to be corrected if that's not accurate. So. Uh, those of you who have more experience with the transformer model can can say, especially Samson or Avanov. Okay, sorry. Uh, go yeah, go ahead, Abhinav. Yeah, I think the the value is same as the key here, right? It can be the key. But it doesn't necessarily have. Yeah. Doesn't necessarily have to be, yeah. yeah. But in this, I, I think, uh, yeah, there, there were three kinds of attention here. And that's why they came up with this kind of abstraction. The self yeah. attention in the encoder, the self attention in the decoder, and then there is one attention between the encoder and the decoder. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we, we can go to co-attention models later as well when you when you do cross-attention. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Shen. So um, next is the idea of what they call multi-hit attention. So the idea is that uh, you break the dimensionality into uh, smaller bits by linear projections, and then you perform the attention in parallel on each of the projected versions, and then you concatenate. So the diagram on the left uh, kind of like shows what they are trying to do, right? So you break the, uh, you do some kind of linear projection, and then you have multiple uh, sets of inputs and multiple uh, scaled dot product attention units that is uh, represented by dimension H. And once all of these are, the output of all of these, you concatenate them, and then you have another linear layer right on top of it. Okay. Do we remember what the multi-heads are for? Uh, to capture different relations, I think. Yeah, yeah can you be uh, a little bit more specific, Taha? Yeah, sure. So, uh, maybe giving an example should be more descriptive. So, if we if if we if we were to just use one head, uh, then maybe this head would uh, just like capture some syntactic relations between the words, like. Uh, it, it could do, uh, I don't know, maybe in the sentence, uh, the cat, the, what was it, cat set on the mat, right? So it would just uh, relate cat and mat, like the object and the, like where it is. But then if we, if we were to add more heads, uh, it could as well, like the different heads would uh, explore different relations between words. Uh, so for example, uh, one head would just relate cat and set, which is the verb and the object, and then another one would relate the uh, cat and mat. So thus adding other heads uh, just adds basically more information in the attention part. Yeah, that's right. So the way I understand multi-head attention is a little bit like uh, LDA, 
So in, in uh, latent derivative allocation, you have specified a number of clusters or, or topics as it is. You know, you have K topics. And then, you know, unsupervisedly try to learn uh, the topics at hand. So multi-head attention is sort of doing the same thing. It's saying there's a lot of information that's being uh, pushed into the uh, natural language representation of a token. And uh, we can't capture that in a single vector. So for example, you know, there might be information about uh, agreement between gender of, of nouns and, and verbs in a romance language. There might be agreement between plurals. There might be subject object agreement uh, or you know, a predicate type of relationships, um, discourse relationships like we talked about a couple weeks ago. Um, all of these types of things, co-reference also might be a, an important uh, part. Um, even punctuation, uh, deciding where punctuation goes is important. So all of those different constraints um, would be forced to be pushed into a single model if you didn't have multi-head attention. So the whole point about multi-head attention is to say, let me learn more than one function. You know, let me not try to do a single function. I'm going to let all of these uh, H heads learn their own useful piece of information that might be useful downstream. I don't know exactly what is going to be useful later, but I know I might want a, a function to approximate it. Okay, uh, we, we see this in several different places where heads uh, seem to be important. So uh, like, for example, in pointer networks, co-reference resolution seems to work a lot better with multiple heads because you can use one uh, uh, you know, the model gravitates one of the heads to learning co-reference between objects and, and some of the other heads take care of others, uh, other things like semantic properties. Okay, so it's basically the neural network version of letting the classifier find useful features. It's sort of doing the, the type of function feature engineering that we expect neural classifiers to do, right? If you remember, if you look at uh, uh, early uh, neural network vision papers, they said, you know, if you look at the cons level one, two, and three, they're uh, finding textures, right? And these textures are being composed into higher level features, right? In, in levels, cons level four, five, and six. And I think the same thing is being done here with heads, right? The heads are, are trying to approximate different types of functions in natural language. Okay. Mm, I agree. I think the other thing that why, the other reason maybe why they also trying to use the multi head is to um, reduce the dimensionality for each of the skill dot product attention. Because as we saw earlier on, the operation is. Uh, Actually, I mean, the typo is dk squared, but they are trying to reduce the dimension of the term that is squared so as to, I guess, reduce the number of operations for each of the units as well. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's my understanding of reading a paper. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. So, anyone else have any insight or want to add any? Additional information. Okay, why don't we go on? Okay. Uh, so, given the idea that now we have the multiple attention, uh, multiple hits, uh, we actually can have different linear transformations for each of the layers. So. Uh, this is just kind of like circling back to the original idea that we had where self-attention is just like a weighted average and we wanted to do something more. Okay, so the reason why I made my earlier comment earlier was uh, this is in uh, one of the papers where they, in the paper actually where they talk about the complexity and where we talk earlier where uh, n is the sequence length, that means the number of the tokens. Uh, d is the representation dimension. Uh, k is the kernel size for convolutions, that's for convolutional units. And 
they have R, which is the size of neighborhood in restricted self-attention. The ones that we are more uh, interested in is actually N and D. I want to compare between uh, self-attention and recurrent. So uh, in self-attention here now, our complexity is the sequence length. Uh, the D is the representation dimension. So uh, for recurrence is, so for self-attention, the complexity is actually N squared D. And for recurrence, the complexity is actually n d squared. Yeah, so this is a big deal, right? We, we talked about this uh, in lecture one because d is usually a very large number, right? Uh, our embedding sizes are usually like uh, like for glove 300. So 300 squared is a, a much bigger number than 300. And our D, uh, our ends are usually not that long because our inputs are usually sentence wise. So maybe up to 50, 50 tokens or so. Yeah, so the conclusion is that the self-attention layers be faster than the recurrent layers when the sequence length is smaller than the representation uh, dimension ID. So uh, next is this uh, the, the idea of the transformer architecture, where it's actually split on, it's actually, you can have to think of it as two parts. There is the encoder side, which has six identical layers. Each layer has two sub-layers, which is a multi-head attention and a feed-forward layer. Uh, the decoder also has six identical layers, but the decoder has an additional third sub-layer, which is a uh, which is a multi-head attention layer with masking. So earlier on, when we talked about the scaled dot product attention, there was a masking layer that is in the middle. Uh, as to why they need this masking, I am not so sure. Samson, you were saying earlier about it. Do you want to... Uh... Actually, sorry, I, I just saw I have a comment here. Okay, so uh, so the, the, there's an explanation for the masking, right? The masking is to ensure that at the a, at a, at a position I, the predictions for position i can only depend on the known outputs at the positions less than i. So it's to kind of, intuitive idea I can think of it is to kind of like stop you from uh, looking ahead of what way you're supposed to be looking at. Maybe Samson can explain it better than, than me. Uh, yeah, so I think the, for this mass self attention, it's basically just preventing, it's just allow it like the, it's like the LSTM, right? You can only look at previous token. It, it doesn't allow you to kind of cheat by looking at the next, the next tokens in the sequence. Because in, in, uh, let's say translation or generation path, you're supposed to generate the word, uh, generate the sentence word by word rather than, but rather than uh, having, having uh, what do you call it, access to the whole, to the whole context or to the whole sequence when you're generating the token. Because you don't know what will be generated. Does that make sense? Yep. I hope that's clear to everyone. Um, so that's the important part, right? We're we, we're getting the sequence as it's getting built. So there's no no uh, possibility to access data that's um, in the future. Um, you have it in your training, but of course you want to mask it out so that your um, 
training and testing distribution looks the same. Asking just yeah, because the thing when when they were when some people tested Bert for a generation, because Bert always sees the entire sequence at training time, so at inference time, it also kind of expects that the entire input you give it is basically the whole sequence. So when you give it like, let's say you try to hack the, the generation process by just giving, by masking the last token, like giving it a mask token at the end, and then keep giving it a mask token at the end, it doesn't do that well because it doesn't expect the output sequence to be increasing in length as, as it generates. It expects the output sequence to stay constant. And you're like masking things that are in between rather than extending extending the sequence as it generates. Yeah, so that's a type of training and testing uh, mismatch. Right, so we need to mask it so that we don't have the same problems that are our inference is conducted over the same type of data as our training. Yeah. So I think sometimes it, is, it just generates a full stop or something because that's the most logical thing at the end of the sentence. Okay. Okay, so again, I found that if uh, people are still wondering how the whole thing works, there is a very good, uh, again, anima animated illustration. Uh, there's one picture from it that is uh, probably gives you a good idea of what the overview is like, which is uh, the one on the left, where you can see the six encoder units, and then it outputs out to each of the six coder layers. And it also shows what the encoder and the decoder units look like uh, inside each of them. Yeah, in the interest of time, let, let's get... Uh... So the next thing is uh, that is also talked about in the paper is that do have, does having more like uh, units in the network actually help? So the baseline that they actually used was 512 units versus what they call the big transformer, which is uh, 1,024 units. And these are like the blue scores that we, uh, we talked about blue earlier. Um, the, one, the first two columns are actually the ones from the paper where they use the new stats 2014 set. Uh, in last semester, when I, was actually, when I was actually doing my project, I also uh, did I use a different data set, which was the English to Vietnamese IWSLT 2015 data set. And you can actually see that uh, the doubling the number of units does help to improve the, the blue score, but depending on which uh, language pairs, the performance increase might not be that, actually that significant. And of note is that the paper, they did say that the computation time for the big model is actually more than twice of that of the base model. Probably because of the added uh, memory allocation or read and IO operations. And actually when I ran, uh, while I was running the English or Vietnamese data set myself, I also did notice that the computation time was indeed more than twice of the base model. So actually in this case, I did manage to replicate, uh, kind of replicate the results that was in the paper. I think the interesting thing for a lot of folks is, uh, especially in academia where we don't have so much firepower, is like how small can you make it. So yeah, the size matter, but in the opposite direction, like going smaller from base to like small and tiny. I think Taha has done some experiments, so maybe you can also say a little bit. Uh, oh, Samson, oh, I think, yeah. Yeah. Taha. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I mean, I'm not working with transformers, 
but you know, Samsung maybe can say something. Uh, yeah, I I guess I work with transformers, but usually like try to break them rather than than yeah like proposing a new architecture. Yeah. So my point is that you know, uh, it, it's good to also know how how well a transformer can work when it's a really um, small dimensional transformer, right? Rather than such big mm -hmm. ones. And then to understand um, uh, how much expect how much expected gain can you get from going to a large transformer? So, like Shenzhen said, you know, which is consistent with the work here, it seems usually it's going to be somewhere between uh, two points or so uh, score difference when you use a, a large jump from five twelve to one one twenty four. Right, yeah, so. so I guess I guess they made a, they made the big one just to push the Sota up by a little bit. <laughs> so yeah. it seems like one or two points is already con considered good for them, like one or two points above the Sota. Yeah, it is. But a I think some people, yeah, yeah, but then I think there was also a paper that mentioned there's a very high variance actually. So, like for translation, I think I think for transformers if, and for translation, if you initialize the random seed differently, there can be a like variation of up to five points. So, yeah. So so actually, maybe these are just different. <laughs> these gains may may not be so significant after all. Mm hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. Those are good points. Okay. Uh, so next, I think the one that uh, probably a lot of people are thinking about is what if you, can you kind of include BERT with machine translation? Uh, so there's actually this paper that was just published last year and they have uh, two ideas or in the main paper is that how they want to use BERT to improve machine translation is to transfer what the what BERT learns uh, from the pre-trained language models into the machine translation network and they think that the second idea is that they think that this is a good idea because uh, BERT models are also transformer based. Okay, so the question is, how do you add the pre-trained language model? So in the paper, they describe about uh, inserting BERT into the encoder section. And they made a comment that it can be reused for different language pairs. Uh, it seems a bit, uh, so when I first read this, I was wondering what they meant, but what I think they actually are trying to say is that why it can be reused is that if I am doing uh, if I have a bird encode, if I have a bird model for English and I'm doing English to French, I can again reuse this for English to German, English to Vietnamese, English. As long as my source language is English, uh, I, I because I'm just inserting bird into the encoder side, I can reuse it again for a different target language, because what I'm I'm just using the English language uh, model into my new model combined model. Okay. So in the paper, they also talk about uh, how, do, how can they possibly implement it differently. The first way is that they replace the embedding layer in the transform model with uh, BERT parameters to form, now the encoder will have six uh, BERT layers and six encoder layers. And they said they fine tune using uh, the Elmo setting from another paper. Uh, the next idea is that they initialize the encoder with the parameters from BERT. And then the third idea that they actually just wanted to use as a control is they call it the freeze, which is they will initialize the encoder with the BERT parameters and they freeze the encoder. 
meaning that while you are uh, doing the training of your uh, machine translation network, it's the, the parameters for the encoder are not being changed at all. So you are only updating the parameters for the decoder. Any questions? Yeah, I think we should move on. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So uh, in this paper, they did use blue, but they also tried to do some uh, other forms of evaluation that they, that they argued was uh, necessary, which is they did something what they call the out of domain test sets, meaning they tried to translate on a different set of data that is uh, considered a different domain because the in-domain uh, set that they, they consider this paper are from news. So they also tried doing what they call noise robustness, which is they insert uh, typos by swapping, inserting or deleting characters. They added uh, unknown characters and they also calculate what they call the character ngram f score. So the idea is that you want it to be as close to zero as possible. So the main findings of the paper is that when you freeze the encoder, uh, the transition quality actually drops significantly. So the kind of hypothesis that they have from this is that encoder is needed for some of the learning for translations. Uh, the other two architectures, they improve uh, over the baseline, uh, both in and out domain. Uh, but they also show that from Freezer Encoder that the bird information is uh, necessary but not sufficient for machine translation. So they said using more data used in bird training results in more improvement yeah. in general. Encoder is needed for some of the learning. And uh, in general, sorry? Yeah, yeah, you can you can finish you can finish what you're saying. Uh, the last point is that they found that for in terms of robustness measures, uh, adding bird does not actually help. Yeah, so I have a comment on this because it seems the in-domain data sets are news, right? And I would not expect typos in news data. So, I mean, it doesn't make sense that the bird would be more robust because it, it's not seeing this type of noise in the training data. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they and, did not uh, really talk about this in the paper. Mm. Yeah, and also uh, something similar was done for the XLM paper. I think it's called cross-lingual translation or something by Facebook. It's, uh, it's called XLM. So what they do is they do pre-training similar to, they do MLM pre-training, so similar to what BERT does, but without the next sentence prediction. Then they initialize both the encoder and the decoder with, with this pre-trained model. And then they, they train it for, on, on the, in the standard uh, translation setting. So, so they, they say that doing this helps the, the cross-lingual performance better, yeah. And I think also maybe it, it's able to learn faster because it's already initialized with all the pre-training data. Any other comments? Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Okay, so I think this is just a short uh, part that I have about uh, practical implementation of NMT. So last, I think I, I mentioned it last semester when I was actually trying to do some NMT experiments myself. There's a package called OpenNMT and it supports both PyTorch and TensorFlow. So they already have uh, most of the popular models implemented in it. And there's also the option for you to write your own models in either PyTorch or TensorFlow. And uh, I think I just have one, I just found some uh, 
ready available data set if people are actually interested in looking at this. So there's two links over here. One is uh, from Stanford NLP group. And the other is just a article where they actually have a list of 25 parallel text data sets for machine translation training. There's also the fair seat repo. So they have a lot of pre-trained models for like like the ENDE, ENFR, and ENRU. So, so they have like the big models and the base models. But uh, it's, it's not very uh, intuitive if you want to implement a new system. It's more like useful if you want to use a pre-trained model. Uh, can you put the link in the Slack? I think everybody can, the scraps can add it to the notes as well. Oh yeah, sure. You can yeah. also add the paper that you were talking about from FAIR earlier. Yeah. That would be helpful. Okay, uh, I have a whole section on what stands is ambiguation, but I think we could skip that and go straight to Taha looking at time. Okay, I, I agree with that. Taha, is that okay with you? Yeah, of course. Okay, then why don't we thank uh, Shenping again for his presentation and then uh, allow Taha to take the screen. Mm -hmm. and then, um, I know you have quite a number of slides to cover, but... Uh, yeah, I'll try to be fast. Okay. Yeah, I. Uh, I can actually even uh, maybe just pass one paper. I mean, I have three papers in total. Okay. Um, but yeah, we can change it. So uh, you can see my screen right now, right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so just. Okay. So yeah. Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, thanks, Shanting and Shasheng for the uh, introduction part. And so I had three papers in mind, uh, actually like technically four, because the first one is an introduction to the first paper. And yeah, mm -hmm. according to the time, we can maybe pass the last one. Uh, we'll see. So yeah, I'll start with uh, basic, uh, a real basic uh, attempt. Uh, I think Shanting already did a uh, good introduction on this, but yeah, it is the neural machine translation by joint learning to align and translate paper. So it's basically uh, an update to the uh, oh. basic encoder decoder model. What's that? Uh, okay. So uh, yeah, it's basically uh, an update to the uh, encoder decoder model with the attention mechanism in the uh, middle, as you can see. So, this what this model does is it has a decoder uh, that that that's a conditional language model, and it generates a target sentence word by word using the following conditional probability. And so, the, the right hand side uh, of this equation uh, consists of three things, and those are uh, the E, Y, J minus one. So this is basically the embedding of the previously generated target word. So if you're uh, generating, for example, here morning, then your E would be just good, the embedding for good. And then SJ is the J target site decoder state. So it is the target site decoder state uh, that for the, for, the word, for the word we are currently generating. And then uh, CJ is the translation sensitive context vector. Yeah, and so we're basically going to be focusing on this part uh, because this is the attention vector. And so this paper, how, how this paper uh, computes the attention paper is by just uh, using the same attention that Shenting just uh, walk us through uh, using the hidden vectors that are created here. Uh, in the encoder state and the previous SJ minus one, that is the, the target state decoder state, target site decoder state. So yeah, and now we're going to discuss why this attempt must might be kind of problematic. And that is because 
So the representation, the representation of sorts words uh, are same for each context computation. So basically, uh, every time we compute a context uh, for the next target word, we use the same uh, HI uh, each time. But the only thing that changes are the attention vectors. And the next paper we are going to uh, cover uh, claims that this makes the context vectors we are using not discriminative enough so that uh, the decoder's job in choosing a target word becomes harder. And this is because a well-known problem called over-translation. Uh, what over-translation is, is that the, so when you, when you, when you feed the, the equation here with the same context vector each time, your decoder tends to uh, generate the same target word repeatedly for different iterations, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm going kind of fast, but if you have any questions, you can just interrupt me and ask. Uh, so please do so if you have. I'll just keep, keep going for now. So yeah, our next paper tries to solve this uh, by introducing another mechanism. So on the left here, you can see the vanilla attention, uh, the, the method we just saw in the previous paper. So what it does is it basically feeds the uh, words in our source sentence to, a, to an encoder, and then uh, it generates some uh, representations for each word. And at each iteration to create a new target word, uh, it just uses the previous state uh, to find the new context and generate the target word accordingly, right? So we just saw this, it's, it's basically the same thing. And what our paper tries to do is just another mechanism that, that would produce the hidden vectors, I mean the hidden representations in a way that would also uh, attend to the previous target word, right? So that at each iteration, now we don't use the same HI uh, for the next target word, but we are, we are kind of generating new ones that are uh, specifically attending to them. So uh, gated attention consists of two layers. Uh, the first one is called the gating layer and the second one is attention layer. So we can say the gating layer is this and the attention layer is this part. So the attention layer is actually the same as the vanilla attention mechanism. It does the same thing. It just uh, combines the attention with the hidden vectors and generates a context vector. But what's different about that is rather than using the same HI for each target, for each target word, it now computes different age uh, for each of them. So uh, yeah, the focus of this paper is basically on gating layer. And how it works is, so it, it basically aims uh, at refining the source representations according to the previous decoder state, right? So now to compute new age, and by age here we mean just uh, H1 through HN, the combination of H1 through HN, so the word representations and the source type, source word, source sentence. Uh, yeah, to compute that, it combines the ones in the encoder state, so the ones here, uh, with the previous decoder state, and computes new uh, hidden representations, new source representations. And yeah, in order to do that, uh, we are basically adding a GRU to our architecture, and that is right here. And what this GRU does is it takes the, yeah, it takes the source representation H, H as the history to the GRU, and the previous decoder state as the current input. And just feeding both of them to the GRU, we are trying to get our new source representations. AG, so-called. So the equations for GRU looks like this. Uh, we basically have a reset gate and an update gate. That's quite common for GRU. And what they do is, uh, so these, these gates combined are trying to measure the degree of semantic match between the source word, source sentence, and the partial translation so far. And then, uh, our reset gate determines 
uh, as you can see here, how much of the original source information could be used to create the new uh, age bar. And then the update gate defines how much the original source information should be kept around, as you can see here. Yeah, so, so the motivation behind this architecture is by doing this, by creating different source representations for each of the target words here, they're saying that now the context word, the context representation is much more discriminative. Thus, uh, the repetitions of the same words in the target translation should be diminished, right? So here's some example translations uh, generated by different systems. So the RNN search here is basically the vanilla attention, the previous paper. And you can see that uh, gated attention does much, much of a better uh, exam, uh, job in doing the translation, although it's just a sample from the paper, so we don't know. And the, the gated attention inverse here is just, as the name suggests, it's just the inverse uh, of this GRU. So basically, rather than feeding the source representation as history and the decoder state as the current input, they just reverse it and feed the decoder state as the history and the, the, the source representation as the current input. So it's basically quite the same thing. And they, they also suggest that it doesn't change a lot of things in terms of the performance. So yeah, one thing to note is that, so this is a visualization of the context vectors for both of the models. So on the left, you can see the, each column here is a representation of the words here, uh, representation of the context words uh, here. And for the case of RNN search, you can see that it's quite smooth and it's, it's really not that discriminative. It doesn't change a lot from, uh, from one word to another. But on the left, on the, on the right side, uh, you can see the same for the gated, gated attention mechanism. And it really uh, introduces some difference between each column. So this was basically the motivation behind their uh, approach. So we can see that it works well. And in order to evaluate how good does it do uh, in terms of their aim, so the over translation problem, uh, they introduce a new metric called the repetition rate. And GRR, and what it does is it just calculates the portion of repeated n-grams in this in a target sentence in a target translated sentence, and they show that the the n-gram repetition uh, does go down from the RNN search the vanilla attention mechanism to their new uh, introduced model. So yeah, I mean, I mean the the difference is not quite a lot, but it goes down, so I guess they achieved what they're aiming. Yeah, so this was a basic sequence to sequence model that uh, I thought would be beneficial after uh, introducing the, trend, the attention mechanism. Now I'll go on uh, for another paper. Okay, well, I have three minutes. <laughs> uh, evaluation measure. Um, yeah. Here, I want to stress that the NGRR is not necessarily, you know, you don't want it to be zero, right? Because this is just a... Um, uh, uh, oh, yeah, true. Right? So it's just that lower might be, might be indicative of better performance because it has less repetition. But certainly in the case that you would have repeated n-grams, um, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of translation cases, right? Where a sentence has a, a repetition of a word. Yeah, true. Maybe you could also like compare it to the reference uh, reference sentence too. So if the reference sentence have repeated engrams, then it should probably be fine that you have to. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Uh, should I go on? Yeah. So yeah, this uh, paper is an approach that uses the transformer. Uh, architecture and yeah their motivation in trying the transformers 
in uh, machine translation is that so sequence to sequence models are like have a fundamental latency problem since uh, at every step uh, you have to look at the previously generated tokens right uh, yeah whereas non aggressive machine translation uh, like transformers uh, they generate all words in one shot and speeds up decoding uh, at an expense of performance drop as well uh, for sure but yeah this work uh, actually tries to uh, both uh, secure that performance and then also uh, speed up the training and inference part. And in order to do that, they are in proposing a, a transformers, transformer based architecture, which they call disentangled context transformer, so disco transformer. Yeah, so uh, they are not using a basic mask language modeling uh, because they're claiming that it it's inefficient to use them uh, because when you use a mask language model, uh, the model can only be trained to predict a subset of reference tokens, right? So you're randomly choosing some tokens in your source text, masking them, and then just training your model to predict those mask uh, tokens. Unlike a normal autoregressive uh, model where you predict all of the tokens from left to right. So in that sense, using a mass language model is inefficient. But you could always uh, do more than one iteration with a transformer. And every time if you, uh, if you mask different tokens, then you would get uh, more efficiency from your training data. But then uh, it takes a lot of uh, iterations to do that with a transformer. So it's quite uh, slow. So in order to solve this problem, uh, they're proposing this architecture where they they try to do that n separate transformer passes uh, in just one shot, right? So, yeah, if we were to look closely to the architecture, in a, in a usual transformer architecture, what, what you would do is you just, uh, so you have A, B, and C tokens in your sentence, right? You would just mask, let's say, uh, B and try to predict B by just looking at A and C. But what they do is uh, they're not just doing that, but also predicting two different probabilities. So that training uh, more uh, than a usual transformer in just one iteration. And how they achieve it is by just uh, taking out some of the uh, key value uh, links in the in the attention part. So basically, here the first uh, prediction is just predicting a given c, and uh, to do in order to do that, they just take the value of a in, as feed, and in terms of the key value pairs, they just take the c value, right? So uh, masking out a and b. A is masked out naturally because uh, we are we are trying to predict A and it would be trivial to predict A given A. So and we are also doing B because uh, we are trying to do more than one prediction basically. That's the whole motivation behind this architecture. So uh, yeah, but this approach uh, comes with a trade-off, uh, and that is basically stacking disco transformer layers is not straightforward. Uh, the reason being is when you uh, when you do that and like carry different information uh, throughout different attentions, then in the next layer, uh, like in the current layer, uh, maybe you are carrying information about a mask token from the previous layers, so that again uh, the the prediction becomes trivial and you wouldn't learn anything. So. And in order to avoid the cyclic leakage, uh, what they do is they make the key and values independent of the previous layers output. So in the standard attention, uh, um, in the standard transformer architecture, the key value pairs are computed like this using the previous state, previous layers uh, hidden vectors. And they just change it to not to that and just use the word and um, locate. Yeah, location uh, embeddings. So yeah, and these are the uh, 
benefits they get from using this model. So uh, remember that they are not they were not actually aiming to get uh, more per better performance uh, according to other uh, models. They were just trying to get the training and inference time uh, less uh, by just but and in the meantime also securing the same performance. And they actually do that in some of the training so some data sets. They just like get same performance or like close to same performance. Uh, and maybe even better performance with uh, considerably decreasing the training time. And for some of the cases, they actually do uh, quite better compared to other uh, state-of-the-art neural machine translation models. So yeah, uh, should I keep going or do you think it should be fine? Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's fine. I just want to make a couple uh, remarks on that that you uh, brought up. So that's very uh, similar to the work that's being done on unsupervised uh, learning for vision. So uh, mm. especially if you watch uh, Sergei, Sergei Levin's work uh, from UC Berkeley, he goes over these uh, flow models. Uh, I'm sure you've heard them, attentional flow models, um, in which the same type of um, uh, type of uh, feature is being done, right? You, you basically have a neural network learn to predict uh, multiple outputs in the future, right? And you can run all of these uh, predictions in parallel thanks to the GPU. So even though in, ordinarily you would have to do it sequentially, uh, you can find clever models where you can do all of the predictions for each of the time steps all in one go. So um, it, it does uh, greatly reduce the amount of comp uh, the amount of um, iterations you need to do. So it's not necessarily going to be all of these end steps like like you have here, right? You're basically saying I, I'm mm -hmm. going to get fewer steps, um, fewer passes through the same model, and then uh, get get the same results or, or similar mm -hmm. results. Like that. So I think that's uh, that's an important uh, uh, sharing that uh, got imported from the the vision and the ML community towards NLP. So here again, you can get some uh, lateral insight by looking at vision papers. Mm. Uh, yeah, okay, should, should I keep going? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so this is the last paper I wanted to introduce as well. And yeah, it's because, so when we think about neural machine translation, uh, we mostly, thing about just like uh, mapping a source sentence to a target sentence, right? Just sentence translation. But there's actually also an area for the document translation. And it's an it's a whole on a, another problem that is not solved by just solving this first problem. And yeah, basically most neural machine translation systems translate a sentence without just taking it the document level context. And what this paper does is it proposes a novel approach uh, with, by, with an inspiration by the success of contextualized word embeddings. And what they're doing is they're learning contextualized sentence embeddings for document level neural machine, neural machine translation. And uh, in order to do that, they're just learning a model uh, to predict the previous and next sentences in the current given the current sentence, uh, that's that's going to be translated. And they're do, doing it in a similar way to skip gram. So in this, in the paper, they introduced two approaches. The first one is to use a shared encoder to decode the target sentence, the previous and the next source sentence at the same time. So you can see it in the figure as well. So they basically have just one encoder uh, to which they are feeding the input embedding. And they're using the output of that encoder to both uh, predict the word, the previous word, the next word, and the target word, the target translation. And so doing this, they're basically uh, hoping to include some contextual information in the target translation as well. And yeah, so this first approach, uh, it, it just has three 
uh, losses, uh, the loss for the target, target sentence, the loss for the previous word, the previous sentence, and the loss for the next sentence. And mu and lambda here are just hyperparameters that they tune. So the training process for the joint approach uh, consists of two steps. The first step is to train the whole model to minimize the joint loss. That is just the combination here uh, on the collected training set. And to collect the training set, it's just like uh, for the whole document, you just go through windows and uh, take your current sentence, previous sentence, and next sentence, and you already have a target sentence because it's a, a parallel data. So yeah, after they uh, train the joint model, uh, they just remove the pre and next decoders from the joint model and continue to train uh, the reserved neur neural machine translation encoder. Uh, so that is, they, they just remove this middle part and they continue training with just encoder and target decoder. Yeah, like that. So this is the first approach they try. Another approach they go with is they jointly pre-train two encoder decoder models to predict the previous and next source sentence from the current sentence and fine tune the pre-trained models uh, with the document level neural machine translation model. So it looks like this. Uh, it, they basically have two encoders, the pre-encoder and next encoder at first. And they just train this, pre-train this uh, with the data to just predict the next sentence, no, sorry, uh, to predict the previous sentence and next sentence here. So after they pre-train this, they just take these uh, encoders and put it into another model where they add another encoder here and a decoder. And what they do is basically, uh, they just take this, the output of the pre and next encoder, and they combine it with the input embe embedding and feed it to another encoder, which output goes to the decoder and the decoder is just to predict the target embedding. Uh, yeah, so these are the two approaches they try. Uh, and the, the results show that the, the second model they try, so the pre-training plus fine-tuning, does slightly better, although I'm not sure how significant the difference is. Uh, it does slightly better. And um, yeah, they, they claim that that is the better model, thus. Uh, so they also provide a, kind of an ablation study uh, where they tried uh, like the two encoders and the, the single shared encoder for the pre-training model. So basically, rather than having two different encoders here, they also tried with the single encoder and uh, they show that the two encoders case does, again, slightly better. Yeah. And another uh, result they show is for, so these are the two models that they introduced, the joint training and pre-training and fine tuning. But seeing the uh, performance gain from the pre-training, they also try to combine these two models. And they, in order to do that, they use the embeddings learned in the pre-training model and initialize the source embeddings in the joint training with those uh, embeddings. And they see that the combination actually does the best uh, in terms of the metrics. Yeah. And pre-training and fine-tuning does better than joint training. So this is actually the ordering the, from worst to best. Yeah. And yeah, actually that's, I think, all. Yeah. That's pretty much all. Uh, yeah, I went far for just 10 minutes, so I, I hope that's okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's okay. We, we had to interrupt in the middle. So any um, points that you guys want to bring up? So here, I think on this last paper, we should also note that uh, because there's a, a pre and a next, 
you know, uh, we have to be careful about the same things that were brought up earlier when Shenting and Samson were discussing about masking information that comes from the future. For example, all this next information, uh, you, it's not admissible when you're decoding a, 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 or trying to translate a single sentence on, in a stream, right? If you have yeah. a whole document, that might be fine. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the paper also shows uh, like the difference between just using pre and just using next and the combination. I mean, uh, of course, it does better when you use both, but they also provide the results on just using the pre decoder. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one thing I think we didn't have time to cover, or maybe it's missing from those papers, is a, a clear diagnosis of why those things help as much as they do. I think uh, we know in machine translation, blue scores of uh, increase in of one are really sizable. They're, they're big advances. Um, but uh, a 0.4, a 0.3 is usually enough to, to get a paper accepted. So it's uh, yeah. actually quite strongly significant if it's uh, point, uh, point 0.3 or point 0.4. Uh, so um, yeah, those are, those are pretty significant, I think. Uh, but yeah, because some of these data sets are very large, just like Samson said earlier, uh, it's not very clear whether you, know, you take all of these um, supposedly uh, significant results and you try to replicate them, you probably won't get most of them because you know, uh, statistical significance only tells you that with 95 or 99% accuracy, you know, those models are sufficient, right? So if you take 20 studies, at least one will be falsified if we're just looking at standard levels of significance. And this yeah. is compounded with like all the model search that people do, right? So you're, you're fine tuning a lot. So uh, you, you may end up, uh, you know, getting some things that look statistically valid, but that are not really valid because you did other types of search in between. So that's also something to take away from this. Yeah, so I guess it kind of overfits very heavily on the training distribution. Because in another, like in one of our class projects, like Kaha and I, we try to translate, a, we try to tra we train a model on this data set, but then when we try to translate like dialogues, then the model just didn't work well <laughs> at all. Yeah. But, uh, and by dialogue, just mean like one dialogue utterance. So it's still a sentence, but it failed miserably. <laughs> yeah, so why? Yeah, on drastically the, the, so I guess this is, you know, part of what Samson wants to do is look at robustness of models. But I think the robustness that we're talking about is like gradual failure rather than like abrupt failure is what Taha is mentioning. Like complete disaster, like no output or just repeated tokens or things that don't make any sense at all. 